Hello, everybody. I hope you're enjoying the day thus far. Um, welcome to our webinar as part of Rise Africa and ICLEI Africa's Building Resilience During and After a Pandemic uh, webinar series. Uh, today, we're excited to share with you our thoughts on unpacking inclusive mobility in African cities, uh, moving from buzzwords to reality. Just to note that our webinar uh, is being recorded. So by participating in the webinar, you're consenting to be recorded. Uh, and we'd like to invite you to share uh, your name, uh, organization in the chat uh, and to ask any questions or thoughts uh, throughout uh, today's webinar. Uh, this webinar is part of the roadmap to Rise Africa 2021. Rise Africa is bringing together thinkers, doers and enablers, uh, promoters, uh, promotes art, creative expression, other ways of knowing to inspire action for sustainable cities. Um, we've gone through themes uh, of food, SDG localization, futuring, and now we find ourselves in African Mobility Month. This is a month of activation for our members and for actors working on urban mobility across the continent. Um, it's a social media campaign to advocate for people-centered, inclusive, safe, and accessible mobility to contribute positively to urban citizens' health and well-being. So we invite you to use the hashtag African Mobility Month um, and share any resources uh, that are uh, part of the movement of improving uh, access to the city uh, and mobility. Uh, we're very excited uh, that this uh, webinar is forming part of the Urban Festival uh, convened by the many uh, partners you see below. The theme uh, of the Urban Festival 2020 is empowering the civic. Uh, and we find this a really important theme uh, when talking about Rise Africa and our work at ICLEI. Uh, how do we bring different um, actors in the city together to achieve the same goals? So with that, uh, I'm very uh, excited to welcome you to this uh, session, and I'm going to open with the Urban Festival's Poem of the Week, um, which uh, we'll play for you if I get my hands around Zoom. to be third world when your name has been extracted from your tongue and its gravitas unearthed from your mind. With fragments in our hands, attempted recreating beauties lost to the sleeping moon, Africa. You are the essence of innovation and origin of civilization. How have you forgotten the root of all life? The first human words were spoken by you. You cradled mathematics, rocked navigation, pressed paper from papyrus reed, burped pyramids, were visionaries before we were accredited, so we exhaled the future. Exponential innovation and thinking for you was not a program incubated in a hub. It was your communal daily bread, imagination, the language with which we spoke to each other. Fear irrelevance brewed by old knowledge. Fall in love with the future you have not kissed. Set your own table before the world. Deck it with your own systems. Feast on your force to drape descendants with a power. Not all that is foreign is greater than your own. Own your force. Own your ish. Hi everyone. Um, thank you, Emma M Mabaya. That was an incredible poem and gives me goosebumps every time I listen to it. Um, I'm Johan Biku. I'm a professional officer in the urban systems team and also the regional mobility lead at ICLEI Africa. And I will be facilitating the session um, with, um, yeah, for the duration. Um, so maybe first foremost, as my colleague Paul May, please introduce yourself in the chat box. And with this, please add your ideas and, and um, thoughts on what an inclusive mobility system looks like to you. Um, so why inclusive mobility? Um, I think this is a particularly special and pertinent topic um, as we've seen in the last few months, how mobility in African cities have been deeply impacted by the COVID pandemic. Um, it has also shown us how vital it is to efficient, 
functioning cities, but also to, to the people that use them. Um, urban mobility has fundamentally changed because of the pandemic and, and the, the associated national responses. And this has showcased the limitations of our mobility systems and the inequalities and vulnerabilities of our citizens when mobility does not sufficiently cater for their needs. Further, the current situation has reconfirmed just how vital effective mobility is for the functioning and economic prosperity of our cities. In effect, an accessible, inclusive and equitable mobility system has featured high on the post-COVID agenda in the significant role that it plays in, in creating socially just cities. But how are these institutionalized in reality to, man, to manifest fundamental and sustained change, sustained change and transformation of our cities? As many African cities have been working to reframe the urban mobility paradigms towards accessible, inclusive and equitable systems through the various plans and strategies, as well as policies that they have put in place um, to, to decarbonize and to, to create uh, better mobility systems in their cities. How do we understand these terms? How do we, what are these concepts? What are the concepts of accessibility, inclusivity, inclusivity really mean in, in concept, conceptual approaches as well as reality? How do we approach these? How do we embed them in planning and governance processes in African cities? We have got a, a diverse range of speakers that will represent um, ideas from for research from the advocacy group, as well as from local governments across Africa. And we will, during this session, we will address um, elements around unpacking the concepts, um, as well as understanding what this means in practice from an advocacy point of view, as well as from what local and national governments um, require to make this a reality in their cities. Next slide, please. So before we start, <laughs> let's first see who's in the room. Um, we've got a, an amazing turnout for the, for the webinar. And I mean, we've got a wide range of participants um, Biggest, biggest participants group is from Johannesburg, um, as well as our other South African cities, Durban, um, yeah, Durban and, and the rest of them. Um, and also, yeah, Nairobi, there's a big constituency from Nairobi. So welcome everyone, and I'm looking forward to, to hosting this. Okay, so as I've mentioned previously, what does mo inclusive mobility look like to you? Um, if we can just take a minute to share some of these um, thoughts in our chat box, um, we can paint a bit of a picture on the slide to understand from our participants what they think mobility, inclusive mobility looks like for them in their cities, and what do we need to really think about um, when, um, when thinking of post-COVID inclusive mobility. So we'll, we'll take some of your ideas and we'll add them to the slide to just get a bit of a, an, a view of, of what, you, what your thoughts are and what you're, what you're thinking. Um, we have affordable, affordability as being a very important <clears throat> aspect of inclusivity, safety, um, convenience, convenient and accessible public transport where everyone has access to means of transport and, and are able to move. Um, the ability to walk um, was the correct infrastructure was that are safe and that caters for everyone's needs. Um, integrated and connected systems across different providers. So different options, um, different providers, um, gender inclusive and easily accessible um, within a 400 meter um, area. Digital information systems um for timely information um choice 
being able to walk, being able to cycle, being able to use various modes of public transportation. Um, mobility that caters for, for gender, for ability, for economic and social needs. Safety in informal transportation, being able to have access. Thanks so much. This is all very important um, elements of inclusive mobility. And it just shows you that inclusivity has got a, a number of different um, um, elements to that that cities need to consider when designing inclusive mobility systems. Um, next slide, please. So without further ado, we will, I would like to introduce um, our first speaker, Gail Jennings. She's an independent researcher who has done a vast array of, of research on sustainable mobility um, in African cities. And she'll be conceptualizing inclusivity for us. Um, you may see Gail, please, please put on your, yeah, your video. Thank you so much. Am I there? Hi. Yes. Hi everyone. I'm really looking forward to hearing from my fellow panelists who will be talking more about uh, the reality while I'm going to be starting with the buzzwords, which I think, so, oh, sorry, I, I'm going to be, I'm trying to move my own slides. I forgot that, that you will have moved. If we could have the second slide, please. So next slide. If we think about, about ex, uh, inclusivity, what is interesting to me is how, what a recent term it is when we start talking about transport planning. And if we go, sorry, next slide already. If we look at what the SDGs talk about, they are talking about, and this is 2015, they are talking about how everyone really has the right to safe, affordable, accessible, sustainable trans transport systems. And they start talking about special attention to those who are in vulnerable situations, women, children, persons with disabilities and older persons. So those are the people that when we think about inclusivity now, we tend to think about the needs of people who are in particularly vulnerable situations. But if we go back just 10 years, so next slide, to kind of 2010, 2011, the ideas of inclusivity and accessibility were still really quite radical. People were talking about how we need to shift in the way we talk about transport to talking about mobility. So talking about mobility, trying to understand that we were talking about something other than simply getting from A to B was, was regarded as quite in the way we think about, about this, this thing called transport or mobility. And the new buzzword at the time, like 10 years ago, was this concept of accessibility, where the discussion was not around mobility as such. And I've, I've included a quote by Eduardo Vasconcelos, who, who really, if you haven't read his work, he was a pioneer in talking about kind of transport justice, equity, and accessibility. So looking at the fact that we shouldn't really be talking about mobility because having increased mobility isn't really the point, is it? Um, being able to move further or more often isn't necessarily going to give us what we what we are looking for because we don't move because we want to move but because we want to access something so talking about accessibility started becoming the new way of trying to understand or conceptualize what what it is that we were looking for in the transport arena and Corin Lucas whose work is also really important in this in this field started talking about social exclusion or inclusion around transport. So having a look at what, what is it that lack of access gives us in cities. So it's not necessarily lack of access to a destination, but lack of access to, to something else. It could be not necessarily services, but social goods and decision making. So if we look at the, the kind of history, recent history of buzzwords, accessibility is how 
people started trying to shift the focus of what we were doing in transport planning to looking at what is the purpose of all of this. So we're looking at accessibility. So next slide. I'm getting confused between all the slides that. So then if we start looking at inclusivity, again, I quote Karen Lucas because she started to discuss transport from looking at the social consequences or outcomes of what she described as, as transport disadvantage. So instead of trying to understand what do we need to provide and what kind of transport vehicles do we need to provide or what kind of transport services we need to provide, but trying to understand this from a, an inclusion or exclusion perspective, looking at what, what are the consequences or outcomes of the lack of this transport or transport disadvantage. And she describes it as being the um, inability to participate in key life enhancing opportunities. So it isn't simply understanding transport or inclusivity as something, a, a way of enabling all vulnerable people to move, but an understanding of what is it that people need to move for? What is it what they're trying, that they're trying to access? So next slide. So essentially, she was trying to get us to understand um, the, the problem, not from a mobility and transport perspective, but a social exclusion framework and something that is qualitatively explored. So next slide. So if we look at how transport planners try to take on the concept of accessibility and inclusivity, there was it was still situated within this kind of transport planning engineering kind of narrative where people started to understand that we need to start measuring and understanding accessibility and inclusivity but it was but there was still this desire to measure it and this mostly started to take the form of of accessibility measures but looking at how far is it to something how how far um say that 400 meter distance, which is, I think, in the SDGs that uh, everybody should be within 400 meters of some public transport mode. We still, and, and we find ourselves still stuck in this, where we are stuck in trying to measure accessibility or inclusivity with these fairly traditional mobility metrics. So we want to know how, how far away is the nearest public transport stop? And what kind of quality is this vehicle that we are wanting people to have closer be closer to but we haven't yet started to measure well what can this transport give us what what can we access as a result of have of being closer to transport next slide because I, I think i'm running out of time so we're still in this situation where we now have started to use the term inclusion and we've got some understanding of of what what inclusive planning is what we are wanting to what we believe that transport and mobility should enable us to do, but we still have very poor understanding of, of whether we are getting there. So we might now have an understanding of inclusion, but there's very little research that shows once we have provided more transport, better quality transport, more frequent transport, more cheaper transport, are people doing with this what we are hoping that they would do? So if we if we try and understand what transport's advantage looks like, we still don't know how to measure this. We're still stuck in trying to measure mobility and transport as opposed to knowing and understanding how to measure inclusion and accessibility. Next slide. This is my final slide. So just I'm now trying to shift into the into the reality, which I'm hoping everyone else will talk about more. And that is that really, if we're wanting inclusive mobility, we need to understand exactly what we are trying to measure, but also understand that it it starts long before transport provision. But if you want inclusive mobility, you need to really have inclusive planning. So you need to already start with planning for the people who you believe should be included in whatever system and plan with those people. So in, involve people in the planning processes right from the start and have an inclusive approach to planning in the greater scheme of things. In other words, not planning in silos. So inclusivity spans so many 
aspects that I suppose to some extent it isn't it isn't surprising that it's been a difficult thing to pin down. So we are still we are now stuck with a with a new buzzword of inclusive mobility, which at least we better off than when we were still talking about transport planning or mobility and even accessibility. But we're still struggling to understand how how exactly do we get this inclusivity? How do we measure it? What does it look like? What what truly constitutes inclusivity and how do we know when we've delivered inclusive mobility? How how can we measure this through qualitative means to understand whether what we have delivered or what we believe we've delivered actually gets people what, what they want in terms of why people want mobility in the first place. So that was a very quick kind of overview of the last 10 years of, of the conceptual thinking around these buzzwords. And I'm really hoping that everybody else will show me how these things are actually happening, because that's really where we want to be. You can move on to the next slide, which is just links, if anyone wants to read more. But, but essentially, I think we can move on to the, to the reality part of the webinar. Thanks, Gail. That was, that was really um, informative and insightful. Um, and I think the important thing to note is that, you know, inclusivity is so multifaceted. And, and it's in the, the power is in understanding what it is, but also how do we, how, how do we measure this way of knowing of inclusivity um, through qualitative and quantitative uh, means. Um, and with that, we'll move on to the next speaker, um, Crystal Asik. She is, um, she is an independent um, uh, officer um, that deals with diversity and inclusion. Um, and is busy. She's part of the Ability Program at the Open Institute, and she will take us through diversity um, that drives innovation. Thanks, Crystal. Thank you. I hope you can all see me. I had to do some fancy footwork changing the uh, the camera angle. We can, we can we can see you, Crystal. Perfect. Great. Thank you. So, thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, I'm from Nairobi, Kenya, and I'm actually two things which are important to this conversation. Number one, I am visually impaired myself, so I am an expert through experience. And also that propelled me to get more into this uh, sector of diversity and inclusion in all, in all areas of life so that I can advocate for my disabled community personally. So the first thing I wanted to explain is universal design which is the principle that we use at the Open Institute and at the Ability Program specifically, which runs um, within the Open Institute. Universal design is the design of any building, road, product, service, or technology that can be used, accessed, and understood by all kinds of people to the widest spectrum, uh, the widest extent possible, whatever their age, size, ability, or disability. So that's a mouthful, but I do have a link that I that I will share in the chat box if, if it hasn't already been done by um, the organizers here, explaining to you a little bit further about it. So at the Open Institute and the Ability Program specifically, we use universal design to um, carry all of our activities. Mm -hmm. And it's really important to us as well to include citizens. Stakeholders are key in understanding the issues out in the streets, the reality, as Gail said. So active citizens who have empowered voices results in more responsive governments. That is basically our very short equation. At the Ability Program, we have been running a series of activities whereby we have been mapping the Nairobi city at first. We have done mapping of over 600 different buildings and streets across the city, trying to figure out how accessible and how universally designed they are for all kinds of users, whatever their age, size, ability, or disability. So we found all of this data out. Um, we used lots of people, active citizens, like I said, people with disabilities, young people, students, um, professionals in the sector, and just people who are interested in making their cities more inclusive, the societies more inclusive. We went out with them for over a week across the city, and they were able to gather this data, which we then sanitized and digitized and put on the a map, which we now call Mapability. And that's available for you to look at and interact with, which is an open source map, by the way. 
on the Ability uh, website. Right now, the Ability website, I think, is being updated um, and a few things being migrated, but it will be up and running throughout the course of the week, so you can check that out as well. So I have, I have my earphone on, by the way, because my notes are <laughs> on my iPad right here, so I'm gonna listen to music, I promise. So the documentary, oh, it's, it's, being, it's being shared there, great. So um, there are two things as well that um, I wanted to share here, which are the medical models um, of disability and also the social model of disability. So the social model of disability assumes that the environment is the problem and that needs to be altered so that people with disabilities like myself can function and live a dignified life. Whereby the medical model of disability says that it is us, the people with disabilities that need to be fixed in quotation marks with treatments or surgeries or um, interventions, so on and so forth. So we at the Ability Program, of course, use the social model, which is that we need to, we need to um, improve our environment. For example, did you know that universal design has helped all of us in so many ways? Um, text messaging, for example, was designed originally to help the deaf communicate because they couldn't pick up the phone and speak to friends and family. And now, as you can see, it's so well, it's so well, it's been well, so well adopted that every single one of us uses it. Secondly is the automatic car it was designed for people who have physical disabilities to be able to be independent and drive themselves around and uh, function in their, in their environments. But now, I don't know about other cities, but in Nairobi, definitely there are very, very many automatic cars. And drop curbs as well, of course, was used, um, was designed, sorry, for wheelchair users to be able to get from the curb to the road and back again, of course. But now cyclists love them, people, mothers with prams, people who are pushing along trolleys or you know, luggage to the airport, everyone uses a drop curb. So this is a, these are examples of universal design that have been designed maybe for one group, but serve every single other person. So the pandemic, as has been mentioned, um, has obviously shown us the disparities that our transport systems have. In Nairobi, I can definitely tell you that it has showed us that our culture of squeezing ourselves into all public vehicles doesn't work. It's shown us that the motorbike, which is a very popular mode of transport here, it's called a boda boda, um, doesn't really work because you have to be so close to the person um, that you're sitting with on the motorbike to be transported. It's also showed us that overcrowded transit hubs do not work either. It's showed us that technology, as good as it is, at, as it is also doesn't really help when you walk into a space and all you can see are computers and self-help um, machines, but no human beings around to actually assist you. These things have really been highlighted especially for the disabled community because for example if I jump onto a train or um, if I walk into any transit hub and there are only self-help ticketing or you know things like that I have to use my my, my phone for, for um, an app to, to be able to buy tickets or something like that it doesn't really help I would prefer to have a human being there to help me and say madam you can go this way or this way or we've actually changed the route today you can do this or do the other thing. So human beings is really important. We are very important in the development, I mean, the discovery, the development and the delivery stages of any design. So the pandemic, the pandemic has definitely as well in Nairobi and across Africa shown us that we cannot escape things like open spaces. We cannot escape things like multi-use um, neighborhoods. It's really good for us to actually be developing um, uh, designs which maybe are non-touch, which doors which don't need to, we don't need to touch for them to open. For example, it's also shown us that we need more um, spacious environments, bigger sidewalks, bigger and better bus stages and bus stops, etc. And these can only be really implemented well when persons with disabilities or the vulnerable or any stakeholders that um, you are focusing on in your work, in your projects are involved. We need to involve us in those stages. Otherwise you are just designing things which you think are good for everyone when actually they're only good for you or a small percentage of people in the population. I 
as well. One second, I'm just listening to my note. Hi, Crystal, are you still with us? Okay, I think we will move on to the next speaker. So I, I mean, I think what what is so important from Crystal's uh, presentation has been around. Hi, Crystal, are you still with us? Um, okay. Yeah, Crystal was listening to her voice note, her her notes quickly, so she might still be listening. Okay. Um, I'm going to I'm going to carry on into the next one. Um, so yeah, so I, you know the important thing is around citizen and stakeholder engagement, and and you know the the, the fact that active citizens are empowered citizens, citizens. So really getting people involved in the processes of of designing inclusive inclusive cities, um, as well as having inclusivity within of our transport systems. Um, a mix between human and tech. And I think with that, we'll move on to Naomi, our next speaker. Um, Naomi is a transport engineer and the founder of Flown Initiative. Um, and she'll she'll look at mobility from a gender perspective, but also um, women in transport and how we need to include them in, um, in, in our inclusive mobility systems. Um, you, you're welcome to go ahead, Naomi, thanks. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. If uh, Crystal comes back, I'm happy to give her a chance to finish her presentation. Just let me know. That's fine. Oh, Crystal, are you back? Sorry. Hi, sorry. Yes, carry on. I'm not sure where I left off, but um, um, Naomi, you can just carry on. And maybe if there's time at the end, I can finish my notes. Sorry about that. Okay, so hi, everyone. Uh, is my video on? Yes, it is. Okay. Uh, I'd like to express my heartfelt thanks to each one of you for making time to join this webinar. And thank you to the host for putting this together. As introduced, my name is Naomi Mora. I run a nonprofit organization called Flown Initiative in Kenya, which is a women-led organization that generates knowledge, uh, convenes inclusive dialogues, supports women in transportation, and builds capacity of stakeholders to contribute to the realization of an equitable transport system in Africa. So as introduced by the moderator, let me start by speaking about the COVID pandemic and its impact on women professionals working in the public transport industry in Kenya, which we call uh, the Matatu industry. Uh, and Matatus are public service vehicles. So if you hear me say Matatus, just know it's public transport vehicles. So at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic for us in Kenya, that was uh, maybe in March, that's when, we had, that's when we had our first case. We reached out to women working in the public transport industry to give them a space to share their experiences during COVID and to also enable us to understand the extent of the effects of COVID-19 on their professional and personal lives. And in Kenya, the government introduced a couple of measures to prevent the further spread of the corona COVID-19 virus. And this included lockdown, um, provision of sanitizers to passenger, maintenance of physical distancing in the public transport vehicles by ensuring that uh, the public transport vehicles only carried half of its full capacity and mandatory wearing of masks while in public. Now, while these precautionary measures were necessary, they continue to have negative economic and social impacts on businesses and the public transport workers. And so we reached out to the women, as I mentioned, and we found out that 52% of the women had already lost their jobs due to COVID-19. And 
while they were losing uh, paid employment, the women's unpaid care work at home had increased due to school closures. And this increased caregiving responsibility made it difficult for women to find alternative employment and income uh, streams. And please note that most of the women live in informal settlement and majority of them are single parents. So when you combine disruptions, including movement restrictions and the ability to uh, make a living and meet their family's basic needs, you see that this widens the inequalities between the two genders in the public transport industry. And so to that end, um, after we did the rapid assessment uh, test, and then we also got in touch with uh, elected officials of the Women in Transport chapter in Nairobi. We came up with a couple of interventions and we were lucky enough to be able to roll them out. And we first started off with an unconditional cash transfer, which supported uh, about 31 women professionals and their household over a period of three months. And then at the end of it, uh, we, we were conducting, after each cash transfer, we were conducting phone interviews just to find out how the unconditional cash transfer was spent. And we found the money was being spent in three ways. It was being uh, spent to buy food, pay rent, and send the money up country to relatives who were taking care of, the, um, of their children. And then next, we partnered up with UN Habitat and we um, came up with a project using graffiti on matatus, uh, on public transport vehicles, in order to spread messages um, around the prevention of COVID-19. And thereafter, we partnered with a tech company to roll out SMS-based COVID prevention lessons which provided clear and practical communication on how to prevent uh, COVID-19 infection among workers in the public transport industry. And throughout this, even up to date, we are still uh, giving out free sanitizers and masks. In addition, we are part of the Socially Just Public Transport Working Group hosted by Frederick Ebert Foundation in Kenya. And we developed a policy paper and we were able to submit that to the Kenya National Emergency Response Team. And so just to summarize is that based on the rapid assessment findings, the assessment uh, or impact of the interventions we rolled out, discussions we've been part of, we developed a report on the implications of COVID-19 on women in transport professionals and policy recommendations. You can find this report on our website or I think the link will also be shared on, in the chat. I think, um, lastly, I think there are lessons that we can learn from various um, cities. And we've seen cities that have be, been able to, re, to roll out uh, policies on politi policies that cover both formal and informal public transport operations in order to ensure safe services for both staff and passengers. I think there's been a lot of emphasis on the safety of passengers, but not on the safety of staff. Uh, improved walking and cycling infrastructure is complementary to public transport. Uh, in Nairobi, you see that the Nairobi Metropolitan Services, NMS, has um, done a whole lot of investment in walking and cycling infrastructure in the CBD. And this is just to mitigate crowd, uh, crowding, improve air quality and health while easing congestion in the city. Uh, and also encouraging the use of technology in the public transport sector, which in, <clears throat> in the instance of um, Kenya, it's failed even when we have mobile banking. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and then the issuing of health uh, guidelines specific to the public transport industry um, Kenya has attempted to issue health guidelines, but they haven't really worked. I think enforcement and also uh, public awareness on these uh, health guidelines has not been that good. I think that's why the enforcement has been a bit weak. And I will end by saying that uh, we should not waste a crisis. Uh, we are at an opportune time to rethink our public transport model 
and develop one that is agile enough to adjust to pandemics, while at the same time guaranteeing public safety and interrupted movement of people. I cannot overemphasize that it is imperative that we ensure that equity and inclusion remain a key consideration during this time. Thank you. Uh, sorry, Jan, I did you. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, I think it's imperative to, you know, that we in, in, our, in, the, in our discussions around inclusivity to have, you know, the understanding of uh, inclusivity on passengers, but also on our transport operators and how, how these um, policies and practices impact them too, and how we can better support our transport operators and local government um, planning and processes. Um, I would like to just ask Crystal again if she would like to finish her uh, presentation um, uh, and maybe just give some last last points that you would like to add. And we've also have a question for you from Martha Sibanda, um, who says she's like Crystal is from Nairobi, and she would like to hear your feedback on the research. Um, and if these these were presented to city officials and what what um, the conversation and the dialogue was around. Okay. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Great, thank you. Um, I will try to answer that question in a second, but I was just um, at the end of my presentation anyway, I was just saying that um, the pandemic is giving us a really unique opportunity to start integrating universal design where universal design has been forgotten beforehand. Um, so that we can make our environments more sustainable and more resilient for all persons who are using the transport systems, whatever, at whatever stage of the transport system. Um, it's not just about, you know, sustainable cities really, but it's about human beings who are able to, um, to access and use their human rights because we all have human rights. The, the basic human rights of life and liberty are yours and mine as well as a person with disability. The basic human rights of, for safety it's yours and mine with my disability and also for dignity, which is I think the most important. I need to be able to, like Gail said, not just move for the sake of moving, but move for the sake of accessing things like education. If I cannot move to access education, that means I can't get a job. If I can't get a job, it means I, I cannot um, help myself and my family move forward. Um, it means that I will be able to, I won't be able to access opportunities in the future as well. I won't be able to access basic things like healthcare, government buildings where I need to go and do, you know, do my passport or do my national ID or, you know, go to anything and everything that you can think of. It all starts with how I am able or unable to move. And um, that's, I think, the most important thing that we all have to think about when we're designing and when we are working on projects and planning for things and making policies as well, which are the ones which will enable us to have more inclusive societies through using universal design. And I also, um, like I said, the title, uh, like um, Jian said, the title of my presentation is Dignity, um, Diversity Drives Innovation. I believe that through my experience as a visually impaired person, but also through seeing the things that I've seen and the research that I've done as a part of this in the professional, uh, as, as a professional in this sector as well. So that was all. Um, the question from Martha was um, regarding the results of our mapping exercises. Yes, we figured um, through, I mean, not figured, we discovered from all of our data collection that the most accessible part of Nairobi is actually Westlands, even though it is still below the ISO for universal design the international standards that is. We are still way below those ISOs, but it's the most accessible part of Nairobi so far that we have been able to map. And um, as we're waiting for more funding and you know, for this whole, whole situation to allow us to be able to move around and be together and continue activities, we want to as well scale up and go to other cities like Mombasa, which is on the coast, um, the second biggest city, and then other cities like Kisumu, Nakuru, Eldoret, Meru, et cetera, et cetera, and find out what the scene is like over there as well, and then use that data to then take it to officials and policymakers and um, make them understand that this is not just for me as a disabled person, but it's for them as well, because it's very easy for any one of us 
to find themselves a part of the disabled community. It just takes one accident, one illness, one condition, um, you know, aging for everyone to, to experience what we are experiencing as well. Thank you, Crystal. Um, can I just remind everyone that we would love your, your questions and comments for our speakers. So while they are giving their presentations, have a think about what you would like to add or, or even just your thoughts that, we, that, that you would like to contribute. So definitely engage in the discussion and we will, we will read it out. Um, so our next speaker is Alex Johnson and he is a city official. He works with a um, Metropolitan Department of Transport and he's a transport planner. Um, so, and he's, he's from, the city, from the city of Accra. So we would like to hear from Alex, how, how you put inclusivity into practice, how, how local governments are thinking about um, applying this, but also what are the, some of the challenges they're facing and how, how do they um, think of going forward? Alex, you can share your screen. Alex, would you like to turn on your, your video camera and, your, and share your screen with us? Oh, uh, there we go. Nice to see you, Alex. You may share your screen. Still. So thank you for the opportunity to um, ask. Uh, uh, I've been introduced to a few um, approaches that has been occurred for maintaining something that we think is just near to. I think the basic things that we tried to do uh, when the local government administration was given the mandate to collect local transport uh, data uh, was to look at the section of the city um, that clearly defines uh, socioeconomic zones because we understood also that uh, this came with um, uh, a lot of social stratifying like uh, poor people living in uh, separate parts of the city and then you have the rich also living in another part of the city. So our concentration was the low income neighborhoods and the informal uh, settlements. So you, you can see that Accra um, grew in, a, in size, I think 64% um, just from 1991 uh, to 2014. And we think that uh, this is a serious implication or this has serious implication for uh, trying to understand how people move and then what they will need to move. We were fortunate to have a World Health Organization support uh, in establishing some data uh, contents for uh, different modes of transport in Accra. And it covers at a, a distance from the city center of about 21 kilometers. So uh, this data really brought out issues that we think um, need uh, addressing. But you know, there is a very strong uh, detach between planning institutions and the, let me say the construction institutions or the decision making processes to make it come alive. This mobility in terms of uh, the four stage transport model. So you are looking at the trip production factors, uh, where all the trip origins come from. And uh, for the sake of uh, ensuring that there is inclusivity, we are trying to identify the vulnerable groups that would definitely uh, have to be reached out to as far as uh, inclusive mobility is concerned. So 
we are also looking at uh, issues of the mode factors, whether there are actually options or they are just based on the issues of availability. And then the trip distribution factors, those are the influences of spatial interaction. And you can clearly see that, you know, the structure of Accra is such that uh, residents or residential areas are in one part of the city, and then the working areas are also in another part of the city. So there is a disjoint in the way people move in the morning and in the evenings. Um, we looked also at the strip assignment factors, um, uh, which are actually the enablers of spatial interaction. And then we also tried to look at how the COVID-19 uh, COVID, affected uh, mobility in Accra. Now, the center of Accra has stratified. You can see that uh, Accra has grown so big and the network development uh, of the city. So if you look at public transport services, these red lines show you uh, public transport services. Uh, it's, it's, the network grows like a tree-like uh, network. And then you only have the grid in the oldest part of the city. And we think that uh, this has implications for, for exclusive, uh, excluding people from transport services uh, if there ever had to be some form of emergency. So in Accra, you can't think of overseas or fringe communities uh, readily by just talking among groups. But the data is showing that all these fringes may have only one line of transport service uh, reaching out to them. And we think that uh, this is not enough for a city uh, that is growing to become uh, a major city in the world. So um, looking at the issues of means of travel, I think um, the data issues really had to dwell on whether people really have the choice uh, uh, to travel how they want to travel, or it's just because those are the services that are available. And we, we try to look at the motorized passenger uh, goods or uh, emergency services as against the non-motorized. Uh, that's the pedestrian uh, uh, options. So uh, this slide shows a, a typical uh, data dashboard that we would like to have for our department as a young department. Uh, that is trying to build the capacity for transport planning. So uh, a good case study for us was the opportunity to see some uh, uh, transport systems in Japan in such a way that uh, every person can have access, whether they have disability or not. And uh, these are data items that we would want to build strongly uh, to project uh, inclusive mobility in Accra. Uh, I want to mention this on the issue of payments and uh, payment platforms in accessibility. You know, this new buses were introduced in Accra could only be assessed by cards. In fact, it didn't work well because of that or as part of uh, that being part of the problem. Okay, so uh, let me say that we are not starting from ground zero. Um, we have some uh, shape files, open street map, uh, or shape files that we're able to publish on OpenStreetMap. And we have some sections of the city that have been exclusively uh, dedicated for um, uh, pedestrian uh, walks alone or pedestrian movement. And this is the very busy co commercial part of Accra called Okanshi. Um, uh, looking at this uh, diagram here, we were just trying to see um, how contemporary we have become uh, with our data approach. And we realized that major cities have published some data on open uh, platforms. So this is uh, something that is encouraging. We're able to map the whole city uh, in digital form and put the data on uh, open street map. But what is lacking is the bicycle paths or the cycle paths. In fact, they don't really exist in Accra. And we think that as a major um, a projection for sustainable transport, um, this is something that public policy would have to look at. And we are actively working to look at the potentials that can happen. Now, I think the innovative part of the inclusive mobility has to do with uh, the approach that African cities 
they have fraud infrastructure. You know, these are flyovers, very expensive, but you look at the passenger facilities to facilitate movement, they are extremely simple. So we're thinking that, okay, uh, why not just uh, try to be a little innovative, protect people from the weather, uh, provide uh, tractiles in stations, and then make sure that you can use your station also for other purposes. So uh, it is a departure that we want to see in our orientation towards the design of transport infrastructure and to make sure that um, we, we have a holistic approach to centering the developments on people. Yeah. So this will come with a lot of institutional capacity building. And I think uh, public officers or uh, planning officers need to really uh, have training and the competence to be able to engage their communities and, uh, and stakeholders. So the uh, institutional uh, collaboration for our workflows as planners and engineers, I think this is where uh, it, it comes to bear uh, on the need for, uh, for us to plan for better services as far as inclusive mobility is concerned. So this slide shows some techniques in a GIS uh, that you can use for determining walkability, for instance. You know, we've uh, not really attended to the issue of um, uh, innovation in the way that it, it, it needs uh, to be approached. So um, we think that everything that we do at Planet must center on people. I put this from a publication on Rootsledge uh, Journal, and it is by Matthew French. And this is a design or a paradigm that is proposing uh, in, 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 to, uh, to, uh, to be on the issue of the transdisciplinarity, to make sure in terms of academia and uh, the professionals working in the field to make sure that we engage people, uh, not make uh, data look uh, too fearful to be approached and use that data to meet the needs of people. So people-centeredness, informal settlements, making sure everybody uh, has some form of public transport, at least one choice a day would be very important. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alex, that was, that was great. Um, and I mean, you mentioned the importance of data from mapping our systems, our transport systems, formal and in traveling in cities, um, formally and informally, to really understand how you know people are moving and how cities are sort of developing, um, as well as your processes as a city, as a city, um, and and the transport sector, and, and what what do we what what do you need in terms of institutional capacity, and and the learning and the knowledge sharing um, within your departments. Um, from here, we would the next speaker is Lerato Sikamela. She is from the city of Chwani, um, and she's a transport plan planner in the integrated department. Uh, us through improving accessibility through NMT guidelines and she will yeah you can you may switch on your um, camera Lerato and proceed okay um, good afternoon um, thank you everybody um, my name is Lerato Sakamela and yes I'm a transport planner most uh, passionate about non motorized transport walking and cycling within the city I'm in the planning department um, and my key responsibilities is uh, basically public transport. But throughout my experiences, um, I got led and uh, landed up with walking and cycling initiatives. And I think these two, they gel well together. So getting into the presentation for the day, um, the city has partnered um, the city has partnered uh, uh, city to city collaboration with the city of Oros. And in one of our key uh, transport um, uh, uh, projects that we were undertaking, we realized that um, 
what is the city's uh, a need towards a, a non-motorized transport provision. And when we looked within the city, we couldn't find city specific guiding document or a standard or a policy that was uniform and that was guiding internally as well external developers in the space of non-motorized transport. And yes, we also identify that there's a lot of guiding documents nationally, provincially, but these are not uh, speaking well to what is actually going on on site in the city that is being implemented. And through that uh, recognition, we found that uh, there is a need to consolidate, to align, and to implement uniform standards uh, within the city through this guiding document. Next slide, please. So um, currently we are drafting our draft document. That's how uh, far we have uh, went. And as you can see, uh, there's, there's been uh, extensive uh, well um, uh, communication with our key stakeholders and of which one of them I'm going to go into detail later on. But then after this draft document, we are uh, definitely going to back, go back to our stakeholders and inform them and start discussing and seeing what is possible uh, to be approved and made into a standard for the city. Next slide, please. Next slide. Under the status quo, um, obviously, and uh, some numbers, and especially because it's important to look at um, the disadvantaged um, uh, shares of users within the city, which are not mostly catered. We do talk about inclusivity, we do speak about gender, um, and we do speak about disability, but uh, uh, these are, are all the disadvantaged uh, users within the city. And um, coming to like uh, now putting efforts into the space, it's quite important for us as well. And we saw, as you can see the numbers, they are minute and a little bit, uh, uh, on the cycling trips um, in the city, only uh, accounting for 1% within the city. And most of the time, if you mention numbers like this and you put a lot of effort, people don't realize how important it is to be inclusive and also uh, start pushing uh, for such initiatives and pulling from the bigger chunks into motorized transport. And hence, that's why this planning um, uh, documents for us is important. We start off with the bigger foundational pillars and we move on and unifying into the construction and uh, implementation stages. Next slide, please. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, there's a bit of uh, a show here, but uh, what we, we did uh, with one of our stakeholders, I think this would be shared and you'd see each and every picture that leads up to, to that uh, front picture there. I don't know if um, uh, we are able to see the, the, the other different pictures, but in any case, this is one of the um, uh, side visits that we did uh, uh, during our stakeholder engagement with our disability director unit. This is what was one of the key stakeholders as uh, we all uh, know that we don't cater, even though um, policy does direct us, but it's nice and it's also important to go on hand as we all mentioned uh, that people, we need to include them, it's a uh, plan for the people with the people. So our disability director unit made time for us to just experience what they on a daily basis in order for them to even go to our uh, flagship um, admin building, the new building in the city of Swanee CBD, just to access those services, um, uh, utility services and our offices, how hard it was for them to easily link A to B which was for us a shock because with those pictures, you would see that um, in terms of space sharing, uh, most of the illegal hawkers like the trader stalls, they're taking up much of the infrastructure, even in areas whereby there's a wider um, provision of infrastructure for more than two meters, but most of that space has been taken up by taxis, parking on the, on the walkways, also by hawkers, traders, and that actually causes that uh, hazard. And, and it, it's an impediment because um, enforcement is unable to be taken in, that, in those areas to allow for movability of, of walking or even cycling. Uh, they, there was also a, a, a finding that we saw about wayfinding, whereby um, instead of planning for people, and that is disabled, uh, disabled people, that is gender, um, uh, and also for elderly people, you'd rather plan for aesthetics like your architectural looks, 
whereby you put stairways within uh, the entry, the, the easiest, shortest distance to the entry for um, a, a, a anyone, but you'd rather put it a, a, a way back whereby it takes, uh, it's a long distance to go through. And now you are actually discouraging people to now start, uh, you know, accessing the shortest distance and encouraging the use of uh, walking and cycling within that precinct of our 20 house uh, admin building. Construction work as well, where you find your way leaves, um, people digging up the roadways and they're not putting up, there's a hazardous um, uh, uh, holes that are not even barricaded for safety and that causes such a havoc just in front of our own yards. Maintenance as well, um, with the other picture, it's, it was also a, an issue uh, that is not covered and it's not addressed quite well in that present. So um, in terms of um, uh, uh, the first picture that you see, that front picture, <clears throat> uh, we do have some positives of which in our public transport nodes, our stations, our REN uh, bus rapid system, uh, we can see some positive that that space has been covered quite well. It, it's easily accessible and that is something to be applauded for and that we look at those uh, positives as well. Next slide, please. So um, the picture uh, just gives, uh, the next uh, uh, slide gives an overview of what we intend to get as an outcome out of these guidelines. So um, um, there's a few chapters covering uh, most of city specific questions that we were raised by our stakeholders. Um, and those ones that need details, except that uh, uh, they were not covered that well in the national, or they were not clear enough and specific for our city in the national guidelines and other guidelines that we, we have, but um, those chapters are covered. But what's important is that the output is gonna be a detailed, uh, some detailed drawings, which are going to be approved by the city and standardized for city specific project. And there's also a brochure that is going to be an easy and ex, um, a, a visual a picture that people can follow internally and externally, a quick reference booklet. Next slide, please. So um, I think, uh, you know, eventually um, a guiding document is not um, um, going to be implemented quite well if it's not approved. And that's why we needed to, at the end, find these standard documents that, as you can see, for intersections specific to our city, different types of uh, interventions, design criteria for our city to, to, to guide internally and externally on what can the approach be in order to optimize and make them more accessible and easier, safer to cross and different width uh, walkways. And that would be um, our, in our standard city of 20, drawings for everybody to access and all obviously comply to when submitting their detailed design. Next slide, please. And also uh, a picture, right? this was an example of how the booklet would look like. This is sh uh, uh, the short version that we want to give to the public, to our stakeholders as well, just a picture to see how would the approaches be on the intersection and using obviously South Africa, uh, uh, City of 20's intersections, you know, the critical ones that needs intervention. And one key uh, intervention that we want to look at is the retrofitting part portion of it to look at some um, uh, before and after interventions that you know internally as well as developers can look in when they provide their drawings and say, we do have facilities in this area, we do have a walkway, but um, according to your guidelines, we can have it much more attractive and safer, inclusive for all to use by using like, for instance, the, the, the top picture there, um, a, a difference in slope by make it, making it more flatter for um, non-motorized transport usage but also uh, not being uh, centered around our motorized uh, uh, transport um, provision, our modes uh, basically, but shifting it, the pool that I was speaking about, pulling it to more non motorized transport and pushing away to, from the motorized transport provision. So yes, so we're excited about this project because um, overall, uh, we, we, we saw this gap and we feel like this is one key pillar that we can do um, 
at this moment, at, at, at this point in time. Um, in the city, there is a lot of implementations, but it has been fragmented. It has been distorted 1.8 against two somewhere. Uh, there's nothing at all, but uh, yeah, for, through this document, I believe that uh, we can have consistency and something, uh, some uh, 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 um, way towards our vision and goals as the city of Tony towards non multiracial Thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Lerato. That was that was really great. Uh, the the role of policies and guidelines in in um, implementation of inclusive mobility. Um, okay, we're dying to ask our panelists some questions. Um, so perhaps take a few minutes to write down if you've got any questions um, for the panelists. But I think we can get started. Um, and my first question is for Gail. Um, so you note that we must improve our understanding of why people use transport. Um, can you elaborate on how we support local governments to understand these? Um, how do you, how do we support the inclusivity? I lost some of your last uh, question, Jean, you, you uh, were so, breaking up. That's fine. Before we get started, can I ask all of our panelists to turn on their videos, please? So the last part is, can, can you elaborate on how we can support local governments to understand these concepts? And how do we support a move from just measuring accessibility to understanding and implementing inclusivity? Key is to shift where the focus around transport is. You know, at the moment, transport is seen by and large as an exclusively um, in engineering uh, kind of profession as such. There's very little social science that happens in, in public transport or in transport at all. So, you know, if, if there's just one thing that, that cities could understand is that there needs to be a very strong social science component in both understanding transport and planning transport and doing qualitative work as well as quantitative work. So that's the short answer. You can't understand this by doing a metrics. Um, so our next question is for Crystal. Um, how have you engaged local governments um, in 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 the in in your some of your research, um, and what support would would you need to kind of scale up? Line. Um, yes. Thanks. So so far, um, since we've been sharing the research and the reports them that we put together after the mapping. Um, we've been able to partner with a few um, CSOs, uh, but also we've been able to, more importantly, get a seat at the table um, um, with the Ministry of Transport. Um, there are also other ministries that have been very interested to, to meet with us um, and discuss further how they can sort of like access the, the low hanging fruits. Um, because obviously the issue has been money, especially this year, because of COVID, many budgets have been redirected to different places. And so we've been at least discussing with them and uh, the, the low hanging fruits for now. For example, doing simple things like um, putting street furniture in, in, in different parts of the city, because, you know, having somewhere to, for people to sit, the elderly, people who are ill, people who have conditions, it's, it's actually a part of universal design. Every single 150 meters in universal design ISO says that you need to have a, a seating space, for example, better street lighting, cutting down the hedges um, in spaces and on roads and buildings and um, environments where people you know, are accessing and moving around, um, promoting NMT, which Nairobi, by the way, has signed up to doing so as part of its policy for the for the city so um we were discussing low-hanging fruits for the moment but our next budget cycle is coming up soon whereby different ministries and different um, departments of the government are now discussing what where to direct money to the in the next uh 2021 financial year so we are at a good place right now um where we're carrying on uh, these conversations that's great um so the next question is for alex how are you using data to empower people in your processes so thank you very much 
Um, I think the, the first thing we we're able to do is to try to uh, get our data published uh, as an, as an uh, open, open data. So you don't need to come through to the local government office uh, to have access to the shape files and the uh, API data for all the public transport routes that we have mapped. And fortunately, we've been able to get some assistance from the tech community and uh, the data has been put in an application uh, for use for trip planning, for instance. So uh, visitors to Accra are not lost in the maze. Um, it looks like a chaos, but it's organized chaos. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Are you, we can hear you. Are you still there? Yeah. So can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So I was saying that uh, we've been able to put that data uh, by the help of the tech community on a mobile application so that people can have access to the data to plan trips in the city, for instance. And every data we collect is uh, open data. So uh, there's a repository uh, online for people to just go directly and download them. Um, it's open data. I mean, that's the most important thing. Mm. Yeah. That is very, that's a very important point. Um, that everybody has access to the data. Um, exactly. Yes. Uh, next question is for Lerato. Um, this question is from John Barre. Um, he wants to know how is the overall modal split in the city of Tuane? Um, how does it look like to give an indication of its mobility and inclusion? Um, thank you. Um, so yeah, we, we, we do um, have our, you know, technical model share in terms of minibus taxis that caters for 25%, the walking um, uh, total trips is 20% and cycling only 1%. And we do have a little bit of data for some uh, key projects whereby cycling that can go up to 6% um, on one of our major corridors actually that we are currently doing implementing infrastructure on. But uh, it's not, um, I think as also mentioned that it, we haven't found a way of um, quantifying for inclusivity. And um, so that's one area that we probably need to look into, especially because we've got our How Train Rapid Link um, that's uh, within the city. And just to see how that those the stations, the integration with other, our Prasa, uh, our rail, uh, Metro Rail, and also mini how that how that uh, integrates well, and how can people access and you know link to other uh, destination. But to be honest, we haven't uh, quantified it to be specific for inclusivity. Thank you. Um, our last question is for Naomi. Um, how do you, if you could give local governments three or four key elements of how best, you know, transport operators and women in transport can be supported um, in policy or process. Um, what would you, what would you suggest to local governments? Um, thank you. Do you mind repeating the question? Sorry, I think I lost you somewhere. If you could give three or maybe two or three elements of how, how local governments can best support transport operators and women in transport, um, if local, you know, local governments are listening, what, what would those be? Um, I would say is increased efforts to increase uh, awareness and build capacity of government officials because we've been in forums, for example, where um, some city officials do not feel uh, the need to consider gender in terms of their planning and interventions, and they see it as something that's not the top priority. Um, another thing is to strengthen partnerships between the private sector, private, uh, private sector, the private public sector, private sector, and development partners. And I think lastly is to strengthen coordination within government agencies. For example, in Kenya, we have, I think about four or five um, agencies that deal with transport and there is no you know coordination between the the various agencies yeah 
Thank you. Um, which question? Um, so perhaps as, as part of, I would actually like to ask Gail, and in terms of your closing reflections, we've heard from uh, two different advocacy groups. We've heard from our city planning. Um, what are your closing sort of reflections on, on everything that you've heard and, and in terms of, of your research and, and what, what we still, yeah, what, what, what we need to think of going forward? unfair <laughs> i'll have to think i think that by and large though we still are stuck where where we are stuck if i can put it that way you know i think there's become quite if i think specifically around something like non-motorized transport there's become uh, there's a lot more emphasis on nmt and there's this there's this un, generally uncritical belief that nmt is is by definition inclusive mm -hmm. and so we think about we think about inclusive transport or mobility as as for example that we are now catering for people who walk and cycle but there still remains a lack of nuanced understanding about who walks and cycles the fact that there are different kinds of people who walk and cycle that there might be different needs that in fact the majority of people who currently walk and cycle might rather not be walking and cycling, but might prefer to be taking public transport, for example. So I think we, we continue to make uncritical assumptions about things that have been labeled inclusive. So until we, we have a very clear understanding of, of what inclusive is, and, and I'm now not talking about universal design, because I think universal design is, is a lot more clear in that sense, because in many instances, it's understood as a set of technical guidelines. But in terms of trip purposes or what people want, we are, we are not looking so much as, as what people want out of transport. We're looking at what people want out of life. Mm -hmm. And once we have a much clearer understanding of, of that, we can then provide the, the ways that people can access that. And it might not be transport might not be a mobility intervention at all. It, it really is a, it's a social, a socioeconomic issue, not a transport issue. And I think we still, we continue to be, to be stuck in seeing it from a transport and mobility lens and from a modal lens. We tend to think that this mode is more inclusive or that mode. And if we only do this, mm -hmm. so, um, yeah, Naomi, I see you've appeared on video. So you, would you like to, Respond. I mean, I think it's a very, very complex issue, but because transport is, is largely a kind of technical and engineering domain, it will, there's always the tendency to gravitate toward it being engineering solutions, um, kind of quanti quantitative metrics, how we can, this mode, this, this, this is the next kind of um, magic bullet, this mode will fix this. And so I think there's a lot of discussion that still needs to happen. I, and I just, I, I can see we're running out of time a little bit, but I do have one more pressing question that I'm dying to ask. And I, I would like to know from, from, from local governments, from our city officials, if, if people and advocacy groups and activists want to get involved in your processes um, to, that could potentially help inform some of your policies and strategies and guidelines, what are the processes that they need to follow or how can they get involved um, you know in in these processes so that's either between lerato or alex just very very briefly uh can i ask lerato I, i'll ask lerato because you you mentioned your guidelines so i think maybe that would be great um yeah it, it's, a, it's a bit of a, a tricky tricky a little bit tricky one but Obviously, through association, through platforms like this, then we can we can get connected, and we do remember, uh, for instance, um, stakeholders. I don't remember their name um, exactly, but we do uh, like in our endeavors. After we got the attendance registers, we were able to actually include them in the guidelines, which was so fortunate for us, and they they gave really uh, impressive input 
from their side, city planning perspective, and um, uh, on their uh, in, in NGO uh, provision of, of bicycles, you know, there are lots. So uh, through platforms, I think, and also, you know, just reaching out, uh, we are able to avail ourselves, but there's no direct channel to say you follow this, but yeah, just connecting, send an email to uh, some of us, a call, a WhatsApp, and we can just start the dialogue and interact like that. Thank you so much for that. And I think on that note, um, we have to end this discussion. I, I mean, as Gail said, you know, this is an ongoing discussion and it's an ongoing conversation that we need to have with each other and, and get more people into the conversation, the dialogue. And yeah, so I, I will hand over to my colleague, Paul, and he will take us into the closing. Well, uh, I'd, I'd like to start firstly just by thanking our, our speakers uh, and participants uh, for an amazing conversation. Um, there was a conversation we were having uh, live and then a, a conversation uh, on the side about uh, integrating the um, minibus taxis and how do we do that, um, as well as some very uh, well-framed questions. And to me, what's been exciting about this webinar is, is the tension uh, brought up between what each of the speakers are speaking about. So uh, a very powerful uh, uh, advocacy for data-driven solutions um, combined with the need to say, no, we must go beyond data to think about what qualitative understanding of informality, uh, excuse me, of mobility can uh, offer us. Um, the need and the, the value of universal design uh, and the need to uh, go beyond uh, that. Um, the value of having guidelines which offer guidance uh, for people who wish to participate, uh, but then the, the question of is NMT enough? So these are fantastic tensions to draw out. Um, and I'd just like to thank everyone for the uh, conversation uh, that's been had. Um, we are continuing our conversations uh, as part of uh, many platforms. Uh, so I'd just like to reflect on uh, this webinar being part of African Mobility Month. Uh, we're nearing the end of, of the month um, uh, from our side. I know South African Transport Month is ongoing for the whole of October, um, but please do share your thoughts using um, African Mobility Month as a hashtag, share case studies, reports, ideas, provocations. Um, we've seen a lot of people come on board and um, as Lerato added, uh, these types of platforms are very much around uh, drawing out uh, the exciting ideas and challenging um, some of our assumptions. As part or after African Mobility Month, but certainly part of the movement, uh, we'd like to invite you to join the Smart Mobility Africa Live Congress, um, which will happen towards the end of October, uh, and it'll uh, expand along a lot of the ideas that have uh, emerged as part of this. What we are very excited for in November is adding a layer to this conversation at the Local Climate Solutions for Africa Congress. Um, which has a theme of financing for change. Uh, often when we talk about our, um, as we've termed them, buzzwords uh, for sustainability, we forget that uh, it doesn't necessarily matter what our themes are. We really have to consider uh, governance and finance as the levers for um, implementing these. So the theme of uh, this Local Climate Solutions for Africa Congress is financing for change. There will be uh, sessions around uh, climate, of course, energy, uh, research and development, uh, nexus, circular economy, um, as well as uh, mobility. We will take uh, the conversations around inclusive mobility and add a layer uh, of climate and environmental equity. Um, this has been a session as part of the Rise Africa Roadmap. Um, in November, we'll be uh, contributing thoughts to circular economy uh, at the LOCS Congress, and in December, exploring uh, how we embed nature in our cities um, and uh, how we support um, nature-based solutions um, for sustainable development. Again, I'd like to thank everyone for uh, their participation here. Uh, we'll make available the recordings um, and the presentation for your perusal um, in the next days. Stay well, everybody, and uh, see, you, see you soon. Thank you.